So I had a very rough time trying to figure out what I, not what I was going to talk about, but how I was going to speak about my topic today. Because in a lot of academic circles and in a lot of academic spaces, to speak on my specific experiences as a black woman, and more specifically, a black woman from the hood, if you will, it's not, it's never been something that's been specifically welcomed. So, and also hip hop and rap music and the culture, if you will, as well, has never been something that I've been able to source in my academic texts. It's never been something that I've been like, the Migos, circa 2018, <laughs> to necessarily be something that people have seen as valid. So upon trying to figure out and draft what I really wanted to talk about, I was like, wow, I have to tell the people about myself. And I've realized that it's not necessarily realities outside of hip hop music that a lot of people are used to hearing about, other than I come from the hood and we've made it up. But that's not what necessarily what I'm talking about today. So naturally, also, I'm a very bad storyteller, but I'm trying for everyone today. So I just want that to be known. So I wanted to like first start by talking about the first time I heard a Lil' Kim song. Changed my life, a transformative moment. I loved her so much, I still do. My Queen B, salute. Um, I can't tell you how old I was because my memory is shot, but I do remember for some reason I was in Toronto with my mom and I don't know who put the TV on or who left me in a room by myself to watch these videos, but Lil' Kim featuring Cisco's How Many Licks came on and I was like, wow her mind. It was baffling to me because I was used to hearing rap music from my father who put me on to a lot of Easy e Ice Cube, Ice T, West Side Connection and NWA. So for folks who don't know, a lot of things from the West Side, you know, LVC, Compton, California. And those those genres initially really helped inform the ways in which I navigated as a black person. And hearing, hearing, is anyone familiar with NWA? Besides like, you know, the Boys in the Hood film, you know, that came out a hit. Um, so when, when I first heard like NWA and I heard the infamous song, F the Police, and legitimately the opening is, F the police coming straight from the underground. A young brother has it bad because I'm brown. And for a lot of people who live in states like Canada and who live in states like cities like Ottawa, Toronto, or even just like the United States, that line informed how we saw the police and how we still see the police in like recognizing police brutality, anti-blackness, le racisme. And so that was the music that I was used to and it helped me really just be like, yeah, I'm black, I'm proud. I'm also from the hood and I'm loud. But Lil' Kim, she was different, different. <laughs> like when I heard Lil' Kim, I was like, oh, it's a girl? It's a girl doing this? And it wasn't just like a Shanti featuring Ja Rule a feature and she's singing. She's talking like the mandem. She's legitimately loud and in charge and talking about men in the same way that men, that I was used to hearing men speak about women. Her mind, wow. <laughs> and so when I was able, when I recognized that there were women in hip hop in something that I was used to being traditionally male oriented, I knew I had to hop on that wave. I was like, wow, dad, I love you. Wow, mom, you really put me on to Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston, but this isn't, this isn't who I wanna be. I want to be Lil' Kim. And through that, I found artists like Missy Elliott, and let's talk about her, because she is an icon, and we need to pay her her dues. A dark-skinned woman, um, size, like a, a non-skinny woman as well, legitimately creating anthems for girls in the hood everywhere. When I was a kid, all I remember is everyone being like, I have a cute face, chubby waist, big legs, in shape. <laughs> like, no one can tell me, like, all the kids that I grew up in my neighborhood, we all knew the lyrics by heart. It was anthems, and that's what these black women provided me with, and that's 
it was very different from what I was used to in terms of hearing the music on the radio, you know, a little, like, Say My Name is a banger, but it was very different. It was women being in charge, taking, taking ownership in the things that society did not necessarily like about them. And that's why I stand for women in rap music specifically, right? Because they're here and they're taking space in ways that a lot of people do not like. And black and why that's really important as well is the fact that they created an avenue for themselves, right? If folks are aware of the history of rap music and where it comes from, and we're talking about the Bronx and Southside Jamaica Queens and all of the things, there are whole books for black men, like in terms of the history of hip hop. And we only reserve specific chapters for black women. Right? We'll talk on the MC Lights, we'll talk on the Queen Latifahs, we'll talk on Roxanne Shantae, an icon, but we don't have books for them, right? It's, it's in passing. And so what we have to recognize in saluting and in recognizing black women in hip hop is one, they're, like, I'm gonna say their minds a lot, but they're creative geniuses, right? There are ways with words, they're telling their own stories and they just, created an avenue that was not for them. Like, it was dirt, and they, cre they created entire streets. That's the thing. Like, that's what we really have to recognize. So, it goes on to, like, speak on how black girls from the hood create their own things, right? And frequently, just like black women in hip-hop and in the music industry, it is not something that initially is well-received, right? When I was in high school, Nicki Minaj was that girl. Stan salute. Everyone can have bad opinions about her, but if I start pull up in a monster automobile gangster, whatever, like, you know who she is. And for the longest time, she held her own amongst men. And I remember when people would legitimately just insult everything that she do that she didn't do, like, oh, her hair is pink. Who she thinks she is? Oh, like she's talking about that, how dare she? And these are things that a lot of black women have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Entering spaces, creating their own things, being creative, and then being met with the backlash of the mainstream, right? Because when we're talking about like black women and like intersectionality is a term that a lot of people are like, I'm afraid of that. But like for black women, it's the fact that we have the concept of race, like racism is a thing. And then there's also the concept of misogyny. So misogynoir, a term that a lot of people talk about is the fact that like there's a specific type of misogyny for black women. But what gets left out of the concept of intersectionality is class, right? is the fact that hood black girls and black girls from the ghetto, black girls who do not, who are not able to come to school, black girls who grew up playing double dutch with their friends, who are out here singing all of the songs, are always left out of the dialogues of including black girls because we don't respect black girls from the hood, right? I think that we frequently make a joke out of them when we're looking at social media and we see like black men dressed up in wigs and like terrible lipsticks, like they're making mockeries of hood black girls, right? And that's what we like specifically need to like understand. And so why, what I'm getting at, right? And y'all are probably like, Marissa, you really just out here just talking about all the music, I'm not getting anything. <laughs> Is because when we're talking about showing up, right? Who are we showing up for? We need to show up for black women. and. We, a lot of people are going to be like, but I love Michelle Obama and she's a black woman. I love Beyonce and she's my queen, my idol. But are we doing the same for black women that do not fit our specific way of seeing what the feminine is and what blackness is? Because what hood black girls do specifically is destroy everything that you thought existed and say, this is actually who I am, Chief. Are you going to take it or not? Like, and that's the thing, like, hood black girls are the loud black girls that we don't want to hear. Hood black girls are the ones who are going to talk back. Hood black girls are the ones who are not going to say okay if you talk over them. They're going to be like, actually, I was speaking. 
And in a world filled with misogyny and anti-blackness and classism, that's something that a lot of people with privilege do not want to hear, right? And in a lot of things that I've attended and that I've, speak, I've spoken at, we frequently say, we need to look around the room and see who's here and who's not in these rooms, right? We need to figure out how to include more people. But the question is not also, how do we put more people, how do we get the people who are not in these rooms to be here? It's, do these people actually want to be in these rooms, right? Are we actually doing things that one, tackle the realities of the of said people, right? Because if we're going, if we're at a conference about accessible education and free tuition for all, we're not touching on the fact that a lot of schools are underfunded and how like housing also has an impact. So there are so many other things that we have to tackle, right? Are we, and also respectability, like am I, am I going to be forced to speak in a certain way to enter those rooms, right? We talk about like letting people into rooms and letting people have voices, but we're not talking about how they have to alter their voices and alter the way that they have to be to enter those spaces. For a lot of people, that's not the way. Like they do not want to do that. And a lot of us do not recognize this, but we force it, right? Upon coming to this TEDx talk today, I'm sure a lot of people are like, I really want to dress up. And how did we dress up? Like look at how you're dressed. Like if I were to come in a, I really wanted to come in a velour sweatsuit, you know, come through in a do-rag and like straight backs. And I'm sure not a, a lot of people would be like, that's not the vibe I wanted today, right? So like we also have to look about what is good, like what we take on as being what we want to receive and who we want to receive that from. We're vibing? It makes sense, yeah? <laughs> so that's really that. And in talking about rap music today, right? there's an avenue for every black woman, right? Like we have the baby mothers, we have all of the dolls, Asian doll, cash doll, dream doll. I'm sure I'm missing a lot of them, but like there are doll, Cuban doll. Um, we have Megan the Stallions. We have all of these different black women talking about all of the things and not playing by these rules, right? And a lot of that is owed to Lil' Kim and Missy Elliott and Nicki Minaj who paved these ways, right? And so while not all of us are rappers, not all of us are industry moguls, when we're asking ourselves, how do we show up, right? Because the people I do it for, when they ask me what I do and who I do it for, it's for black women, exclusively for hood black girls, right? That's, it said it in my intro, how we show up for them is one, we need to learn to love black women, right? We need to learn to embrace black women, not for who, they, who we want them to be, who they can be, who they ought to be, but for who they are. And not despite the fact that they're from the hood, despite the fact that they didn't go to school, but for those simple things, right? We cannot disregard essential parts of their identities in order to respect them and in order to love them. And we also need to pay them their dues. When we talk about culture, when we talk about impact, could black girls, the prototype, skelet, that's, see, <laughs> tout fait. they did it all, right? So like, that's also something that we have to recognize, pay them their dues and give them their respect. If we're asking them to come in rooms, are we paying them? Are we also make, are we incentivizing them to also come in these rooms, right? And finally, it's just, we need, we need to let black women create, right? It's not how do we create for black women? How do we do things for it? It's also, we need to just give them their space and let them do their things and go away, right? I think there's this like need with a lot of like, the liberal, I don't want to say the liberals, but a lot of people who do want to help and who do want to engage and who do believe in feminisms and intersectionalities to be like, how can I be involved? And you can, and what I can truly say is the best way that you can be involved is like giving them the things and leaving them alone, right? Because as much as like we want this big space and kumbaya and hold hands together and have, I don't want to say a sisterhood, but be in solidarity. Sometimes there's solidarity and isolation and in leaving people alone. 
especially when we recognize that all of our identities in, rela in relations to black women, they can kind of be oppressive, right? And that's also for other black folks in the room. Like, if you grew up, like, I'm, this is going to be very Ottawa specific. Like, if you grew up in like the soft streets of Canada, it's going to be very difficult for you to like talk to someone who's from Richie Ramsey Penny and being like, I understand you, brother. It's never going to be that. So we all need to recognize that sometimes we need to leave it be and let black girls rock and let black girls do their thing. And if you don't, if like, if you need inspiration, listen to the black girls push their pen and truly you'll hear their stories. Like if you are not around black folks, like listen to their stories. That's probably going to help you humanize the people that you do want to help as well. So yes, merci beaucoup.